In this video, I'll discuss basic network terminology. From a high level, most home and business networks are laid out similarly, in that we've got a local area network, which connects to a wide area network such as the internet, but between the two, to protect the connection, we have a router slash firewall. Often, a router and firewall are the same device, where we might even be using technologies such as NAT, network address translation. This allows us to use internal private IP addresses that get translated to a public address when we make a connection to the internet. So the LAN exists behind our router firewall. On the LAN, each computer on our internal network must have a unique MAC address, which is a hardware address, as well as an IP address, which is a software address. A MAC address is a 48-bit hexadecimal address, whereas IPv4 is a 32-bit software address, such as 192.168.1.1. We've also got IP version 6, where it is a 128-bit hexadecimal address. In order to communicate on the network, we must have a connection, whether it's through a physical network connection or through a wireless connection. As we transmit our traffic, we must have an IP address so that the traffic can be routed to the correct target host, especially if it's on a different network than our own local subnet. We will be using either TCP or UDP transport protocols to make the transmission when we're using TCP IP. TCP is a reliable connection, whereas UDP is an unreliable connection. That means that with UDP, the sending machine would simply transmit the packets and hope for the best. With TCP, the machine will transmit packets and wait for an acknowledgement from the recipient to make sure it received those transmissions. Application layer protocols are higher level protocols such as HTTP or FTP. When it comes to configuring our network in a Linux environment, our system can have more than one network device or more than one network card. Whether it be an Ethernet card, a token ring card, a Bluetooth card, a Wi-Fi card, and so on. In Linux, our names will follow a certain naming standard. For example, an Ethernet interface might be called ETH0 for ETH0, whereas a wide area network interface might be called WLAN0. We manage our network interfaces in Linux using the ifconfig command. Each network adapter that's going to be used needs to be configured with a valid IP address, such as 172.16.49.54, for example. We also need to configure a subnet mask, or sometimes it's simply called a net mask. For example, we might configure our mask to be 255.255.255.0, which could also be referenced as slash 24. It's the number of binary bits in the network mask. The network mask identifies which portion of the IP address identifies our network. In our example, the first three numbers, 172.16.49, identify our network. So therefore, the last number, or the last byte, you could even call it an octet because it's a grouping of 8 bits, would refer to our host address on our network. We must also configure our system with the IP address of the default gateway or the router if we want to be able to transmit packets outside of the LAN. We should also have configured a DNS server IP address. This is used to resolve names to IP addresses. In this video, we discussed basic network terminology. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to identify network devices. Here at the Linux command line, I'll begin by typing ls pci. This will list PCI devices known to the Linux kernel. And I notice at the bottom of the output, there is an Ethernet controller that's been detected. So I know I've got at least one network interface on this host. I'm going to type clear, then I'll type IF config, which stands for interface config. When I press enter, I can see all of the interfaces that my system knows about. The first one has a name EN01677773. That's my Ethernet interface.
Whereas, for example, the second interface is called LO. This is my local loopback interface that I use for testing when I suspect I have problems with TCP IP. I'm going to clear the screen and this time I'm going to type ifconfig followed by the name of a specific interface. Now, the interface, depending on your system, might be similar to what I have, EN0 and so on, or it might be ETH0 for Ethernet and so on. So I'll press enter. Now I'm only viewing information related to that specific interface. And I can see a number of items, such as the IPv4 address on this network interface, the subnet mask, which identifies which portion of my IPv4 address is network and which is host. So in this case, the first three numbers identify my network because the subnet mask for the first three numbers is set to 255.255.255. But I can also see that my network interface has an IP version 6 address. I can also see that I have an ether or hardware address, which is a 48-bit hexadecimal address. But I don't see here my configured default gateway or router. So I need to think about my default gateway if I want to transmit packets outside of the local area network. For that, I can use the route command. When I type in route, I can see entries in my routing table, and the first one has a destination as default. This is my default route. It's currently set to go through a device called router.asys.com. However, I could type route space dash n to get the numeric listing. My default route in TCP IP is always referenced as 0.0.0.0. .0. This means that when I try to transmit something outside of the local area network, it'll try this first. And here I can see the gateway IP address happens to be 192.168.1.1. But I also need to make sure I have a DNS server configured. Otherwise, I would have to connect to everything by its IP address. It's much easier to remember names. The DNS server allows me to resolve names that are easy to remember to the required IP address that the operating system needs. For that, I'll type cat slash etc slash resolve, that's spelled R-E-S-O-L-V dot C-O-N-F. This configuration file has my domain name, which is silversides.local for this machine, as well as one or more name servers. Here I've got one name server, and it's 192.168.1.1. That is my DNS server that will resolve friendly names to IP addresses. So, for example, if I were to type ping space www.redhat.com, because I've configured a valid DNS server, it's resolving that name to the IP address. I'll press Control C to stop pinging redhat.com. In this video, we learned how to identify network devices. In this demonstration, I'll configure network devices using the GNOME desktop environment. In the upper left of the screen, I'll begin by clicking the Applications menu, then I'll go down and click System Tools, and from there, I'll choose Settings. This opens up a Settings dialog box. And so down in the Hardware section, I'll click the Network icon. Here on the left, I can see my various network devices that are available on this system. One of them is called Wired. And when I select the Wired network device on the left, I can see a summary of its configuration on the right. Here it says it's connected at 1,000 megabits per second. That's one gigabit per second. I can see that the network interface is on, and I can see its IPv4 address and so on. To configure that network device, where it's already selected on the left, in the bottom right of the settings dialog box, I'll click the configure icon. Here, I'll click on identity on the left, and I'm going to change the network interface name to something a little more readable, such as ETH0, Ethernet 0. Then I'll click IPv4 on the left. Currently, we have an IPv4 address that's been set manually. It is 192.168.1.240. I'm going to change it to .237. The net mask is currently set to 255.255.255.0. That's telling me the first three numbers in the IP address identify the network. Our default gateway is our router. 
We need this if we want to communicate outside of the local area network. And the default gateway also needs to be on the same subnet that our device is. In this case, the 192.168.1 subnet. The DNS server is set to be automatically discovered. And I can see here that we've got an IP address for it. The DNS server is used to resolve friendly names that are easy to remember to an IP address. I'm going to click Apply to apply those changes. Now, back on the screen where I have a summary of the settings for my wired network device, I don't see the change reflected for the IPv4 address. However, if I turn that network interface off by sliding the button to off and then from the off to the on position again, I can now see the change for the IPv4 address has taken effect. I'm going to leave that interface selected and I'm going to click the configure button again. This time I'm going to choose IPv6 where I'm going to change it from automatic DHCP to a manual IP address. Here I'm going to change it to 5 colon 5 colon 5 colon 5 colon colon 1. IPv6 uses 128 bits in the IP address and they can be hexadecimal characters 0 through 9, A through F where A is for 10, B is for 11 and so on. Here I've used colon colon 1 at the end of my IP address because the colon colon represents a series of zeros. For IPv6, the network prefix, starting from the left, will be 64 bits, which identifies my network. I'll go ahead and click Apply, yet once again, we don't see the change reflected on the summary screen. Well, that's because the network interface is still on. I'm going to turn it off, back on again. Now we can see the new address has taken effect. In this video, we learned how to configure network devices using the GNOME desktop environment. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to configure network parameters for a host. Here from the Linux command line, we can control network settings such as the host name, DNS server entries, whether or not an interface is enabled or not, and so on. Let's begin by typing ifconfig. That's the interface config command. Here I can see a number of interfaces that are available on this system. I only want to display information for my first Ethernet wired interface, which has a name of ENO1677736. So my command line then will be ifconfig space, and then I'll put in that specific interface name. When I press enter, I'm only viewing information about that network interface, so I can see both its IPv4 as well as its IPv6 address, along with the network masks, and so on. I also have the option of working with things like the host name. Here in Red Hat Enterprise Linux, the host name is part of my command prompt. My command prompt reflects that I'm logged in as user root at rhel1. rel1 is my host name, and I can verify this with the host name command. The host name command is one word altogether. And when I type it and press enter, it returns rhel1. That's for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 1. But I can also set the host name by typing host name space and the new name. Let's say I want this server to be called server1. So I've just typed in host name space server1. Now if I type the host name command without any parameters, it returns the current name that I've just set. I'm going to type cat space slash etc slash resolve dot conf. Now resolve is spelled R-E-S-O-L-V. There's no E at the end. This file contains information about my DNS domain name. So that's silversides.local for searching. It also has my name server IP addresses, of which I only have one. This is my DNS server's identity. In my case, it's 192.168.1.1. The DNS server is used primarily to resolve friendly names to IP addresses. So if I were to type ping, www dot red hat dot com and press enter a query will be sent to my dns server which will return the ip address i'm going to go ahead and press Control c to cancel the ping command i can also use the ifconfig command to disable an interface so here i'm going to type ifconfig space the name of the network interface that i want to disable in this case and then i'll put in a space and i'll use the word down so I'm bringing that network interface down. It's offline. 
If I type ifconfig at this point with no parameters, I no longer see that network interface because it's been brought down. Now I might do that because I want to perform configuration or maintenance and I don't want any network activity to or from that specific network interface. However, to bring it back online, I would simply use the ifconfig command, space, the name of the device, space, and then I would use the word up. Now if I type ifconfig with no parameters, I can see our network interface has been brought back up online. That means now it's receiving and transmitting on the network. In this video, we learned how to configure network parameters for a host. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to configure networking from the shell. At the Linux command prompt, I'm going to type ifconfig to display my enabled network interfaces. Here I can see I have three of them. I'm going to clear the screen and this time I'll type ifconfig followed by a space and the name of a specific interface. This way we can isolate a single interface that we want to work with. Here I can see the IPv4 address as well as the IPv6 address on this interface along with the net mask and so on. I'm going to type ls space slash etc slash sysconfig slash network dash scripts. In here we have a series of script and configuration files for networking on this host. One file of interest here is a file that's called ifcfg dash and then the name of my network interface. I'm going to cat that file here under slash etc slash sysconfig slash network dash scripts. The file is called ifcfg dash and again the name of my network interface. If I cat that file to display its contents, we can see it's just a text file that has settings such as the name of the network interface, whether it should be enabled on boot, the DNS server or servers that might be configured for that interface, the IPv6 and IPv4 addresses and so on. So if I wanted to change, let's say my IP address, I could literally edit this file and restart the network service. So what I'm going to do is bring up the previous command where we were catting the contents of that file and I'm simply going to change it to VI so we can edit the contents. Here in the VI text editor I have to press insert to go into insert mode. This lets me change the contents within the file. I'm going to go down to the IP address. The directive is actually spelled IPADDR. That's the IPv4 address. I'm going to change the last octet from .237 to .240. Then I'll press escape to get into command mode where I'll type colon wq to write and quit the changes. But now what I need to do is I need to type system ctl space restart space network. This will put the changes into effect and I can verify that by typing ifconfig space followed by that interface name we can see the IP address has been changed to reflect our configuration. We can also work with name resolution here in a Linux environment. Let's start by looking at the slash etc slash hosts file. This file gets checked first when we connect to something by name because it needs to connect to the IP address. However, names are easier to remember. Here in the hosts file, the first entry I have is for 127.0.0.1. That's followed by a tab with a series of names which are each space separated. So for example, I could type ping localhost and it sees the entry here in my host file and it returns the address of 127.0.0.1. That's my local loopback address. But I've also added an entry here at the bottom of my hosts file for 192.168.1.1. That's my default gateway. I then pressed tab and I added the word router. This will allow me now to refer to my router by the name router instead of the IP address. The name is far easier to remember. We can see that when we ping router, it's finding our entry in slash etc slash hosts. But what about DNS servers? Domain name servers or DNS servers are also used to resolve names to an IP address and they get checked after the hosts file does. I'm going to type cat slash etc slash resolve dot conf. However, resolve is spelled R-E-S-O-L-V. There's no E. And conf, of course, is spelled C-O-N-F. 
Here, I will have a number of name server directives that list all of my DNS name servers. Here I've only got one, and its address is 192.168.1.1. That's the same IP address as the router, and that's fine. The device is both a router as well as a DNS server for name resolution. But we know that DNS is working, because if we try to connect to something by name, for example, I'll type ping www.redhat.com. This entry for redhat.com is not in my local hosts file, but it's going out to my DNS server and resolving that to the appropriate IP address. And of course, we're getting a reply back from that host on the internet. I'll press Control C to stop that. We should also consider the route command when working with our network configuration from the shell. If I type route, it will show me my current routing table in memory on this Linux host. This gets consulted whenever we need to communicate with a host outside of our LAN. For example, I have an entry here, my default route, which is going through our router. Now, if I were to type route space dash n for numeric, instead of seeing the name router, which I picked up from our etc slash hosts file, I can see now the IP address of that entry. So this means anything that we try to connect to that isn't on any other entry in the routing table that's outside of our LAN is going to go through our default route through our default gateway. But we can add specific routes to specific remote networks elsewhere. For example, I'm going to type route space add space dash net and I want to make a routing path or routing table entry to a network of 200.1.1.0 space netmask, space 255.255.255.0, space GW for gateway, I have to tell this routing entry the identity of the router or gateway through which we will go to get to the 200.1.1.0 network. So in this case, I'm going to put in 192.168.1.2. And finally, I want that to be applied to traffic leaving interface EN0167736, that's my network interface for my Ethernet connection. When I press enter, it doesn't return anything, but we could type in the route command again and verify that we've added our entry to the routing table. And in fact, it is added at the bottom. So now, when we try to transmit anything to a host on network 200.1.1.0, it will be sent through the gateway listed here, 192.168.1.2. In this video, we learned how to configure networking from the shell. This video, I'll demonstrate how to configure a system to use network time. In an enterprise environment, it makes sense to have multiple hosts retrieving their time from a single trusted time source, or in the case of fault tolerance, a collection of time sources. Those time sources could be on the local area network or they might be used over the internet. Here in Linux at the command line, I'm going to type cat slash etc slash services and I'm going to grep it for NTP. The slash etc slash services file lists network services and their listening ports. We can see here for NTP the network time protocol that it uses UDP port 123. This is relevant because if there are any firewalls between us and our time sources, or if we have a host-based firewall running on our Linux system, we need to make sure that traffic is allowed in the appropriate direction, in our case, to the time source. We can type NTP date space and either a DNS name or an IP address of a time source to do a one-time synchronization. I'm going to type NTP date space pool.ntp.org. This will connect to some time sources that use NTP on the internet. However, be aware it may take time before time gets synchronized. It might even take up to an hour in some cases. We can see here that it tells us that it adjusted our time. If we type date, we'll see both the date and time, and if we had a problem with that before, it should have been corrected. However, that's a one-time synchronization. If we want to configure time synchronization through NTP that is used constantly, then we have to think about working with the NTP daemon. Let's start by typing cat space slash etc slash NTP 
.conf. And I'm going to pipe that to less. This is the configuration file used by the NTP daemon. Most items are commented, and that's implied where the line begins with a pound symbol. However, what's very important is down below where we've got some references to public NTP servers, and those lines are not commented. So therefore, I don't need to add any NTP server entries. However, if I would prefer to use a local time source within our enterprise network, I might comment out those public internet sources and instead add an IP address or a DNS name for our NTP servers. However, in this case, I'm going to leave the default setting. So I'll type Q to get out of that. I want to make sure that the NTP daemon is running. So I'll type service space NTPD space start. That will start it now. Then I'll check the status of that by typing service space NTPD space status. So we can see that the daemon is currently active and running. In Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, it is not on by default. So what I also might want to do is type system CTL space enable space ntpd.service. What this will do is make sure that that is set to start on boot. But how do we know that our machine is really getting its time from the listed time servers? We can type in ntpq to enter an interactive command prompt for NTP. So I'll press enter and we can see now I'm in an interactive command prompt that says ntpq. Here what I'll do is type in peers. When I do, I get a list of servers through which I am connecting for time purposes. In the leftmost column, if the entry begins with an asterisk, it means it is my current time source. Now, I could also do this straight from the command line without entering the interactive command prompt. For example, I'll type exit, which puts me back at my standard bash shell in Linux. And from here, I'm going to type ntpq space dash p n. I've added the n because I want to see the numeric IP addresses in the leftmost column for my time sources instead of the names. Again, in the leftmost column, the entry that begins with an asterisk is my current time source. The next column is called ref ID and it also has an IP address. But make sure you understand that the ref ID column is the remote host's synchronization source for time. It's not what we are using, it's what it is using. So the remote IP address in the left column, that is the IP address that we are connecting to over UDP port 123 to get our time from that source. I can also see under the T or type column, it's set to you, which means unicast mode. I can also see under the when column, we have numeric values, the when column represents the number of seconds that have passed since our last response. Under the poll column, we see numeric value, and this value is the polling interval in seconds. In other words, how often we connect to our time sources to make sure time is in sync. The offset column lifts the time differential between us and our time source, and it's represented in a unit of milliseconds. In this video, we learned how to configure a system to use network time. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to work through common network problems. Here in the Firefox web browser, I've attempted to connect to www.redhat.com, but the browser reports instead that it's unable to connect. So to troubleshoot this, we'll begin at the Linux shell, where we should start by typing ifconfig to see the network configuration for each of our active network interfaces. My first network interface is an Ethernet interface, and I can see it's got an IPv4 address and a network mask. The network mask is 255.255.255.0. That tells me that the first three numbers of my IPv4 address, in this case, identify the network that we are on. That's important because items like a router or default gateway need to be on the same network that we are on. That means my default gateway needs to have a prefix of 192.168.1. Now that's not true for other things like a DNS server or a proxy server, but it is true for the router. I can also see I have an IPv6 address on my network interface. So I'm going to clear the screen and I'm going to type ping 
space www.redhat.com. We couldn't connect in the browser, so let's see if we can figure out what's happening here at the command line. I'll press Control C. When we pinged www.redhat.com, it looks like the name was getting resolved to an IP address. That usually means that the DNS server is functional. The problem is our local host at .240 is reporting that the destination host, that's the Red Hat website, is unreachable. So what this really points to is perhaps a problem with our default gateway or router. To troubleshoot this further, what we should do is type in route space dash n. This will let us display the contents of the routing table in numerical format. And when we look at a routing table, the destination network of 0.0.0.0, .0 is the default network. That means when we try to transmit something out of our local area network, if it doesn't match any other networks in the routing table, it's going through the default route. Now to do that, it has to know the identity or the IP address of the default gateway. And here, it's listed as 192.168.1.2. So the first thing I would do, if I'm not sure if that's correct or not, is I would perhaps try to ping it. So I'm going to ping 192.168.1.2. Beware that in this day and age, ping may sometimes not work because that type of traffic could be blocked by firewalls. Here, I'm getting a destination host unreachable. That probably means that if that is the correct IP address of the router, it's down or it's firewalled, or it might not be the correct IP address. And this is where network documentation is very handy. If we have network documentation, then at least we know if we're trying to connect to the correct devices. Now, I know that our default gateway should be 192.168.1.1 and not .2. So this is a problem here. I need to reset the default route. To do that, I'll begin by typing route space del space default. This will remove the default route. To add it again, but this time with the correct IP address, I would type route space add space default space GW, that stands for gateway, space, and this is where I put in the IP address of the router, or default gateway, they're the same thing. The correct address is 192.168.1.1, space, dev, for device, and then I'll put in my Ethernet interface name. Any good network technician should have documentation or knowledge of things like the IP address or addresses of a default gateway or default gateways. This is something we should know on networks that we support. So I'm going to go ahead and press enter to add that default route once again. Now we can verify that the default route has been changed by typing either route space dash n. And indeed, I see the gateway is now listed as 192.168.1.1. Another way to do it would be simply to type IP space route. And again, we can see our default route is set to go through 192.168.1.1. So now, if I were to ping www.redhat.com, after a moment, we should get a reply. Now, if we don't, it could mean we have a problem with DNS. However, we were getting a response earlier from DNS where it resolved the name to an IP. And now that we've corrected the problem with the IP address of the router or default gateway, we're getting a response. Back in the Firefox web browser, if we click the Try Again button on the web page, it now opens up www.redhat.com. In this video, we learned how to work through common network issues.